Welcome to the session. Uh, and uh, today I'm going to talk about eight different ways to do concurrency and parallelism in Perl 6 in 40 minutes. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Doing them serially, yeah. <laughs> Damn, now you know how I'm going to do it. OK, so before we dig into this, um, let's just try and get a little bit of precision into uh, our language. So what is parallelism? Parallelism is where we do multiple things at the same time in an effort to decrease the wall clock time, that is, the amount of time measured by a clock uh, on the wall. Uh, the idea being that we solve the problem faster or in less time. Uh, not necessarily with less CPU resources. Uh, generally, we pay a bit of overhead, but we end up with a, a result to present to our, our users or whatever faster, so that's a win. Concurrency is kind of different. Uh, at, at first glance, there's, it looks similar because there's also things happening at the same time, but really the important thing with concurrency is that between the time something starts and the time something ends, uh, other tasks can also take place. Now, that doesn't actually mean that there is ever a time when you're working on two things at once uh, in terms of being, you know, running code on the CPU. Um, if you think about something like Node.js, you know, it's single-threaded, but it's heavily concurrent. Uh, so uh, that's uh, uh, an example where you don't have any parallelism, but you do have concurrency. Now, one of the interesting observations about this is that parallelism is normally part of the solution, uh, but concurrency is typically part of the problem. Effectively, you choose parallelism, but concurrency chooses you. Okay? So a parallel solution to the problem also has the nice property that you know if it's correct if it produces equally good results, not necessarily identical, but equivalent results to a serial solution. Um, on the other hand, for a concurrent system, correctness is much, much harder. Uh, it's a property of the requirements of the system rather than something just for us programmers. Uh, so that's, that's actually a, a much trickier uh, thing. So parallelism is you know, generally the, the easier thing here. Now, one of the, uh, the interesting things, if you start looking at how Perl 6 does concurrency and parallelism, is you see there's lots and lots of different options. And if you start looking in the module ecosystem, there's even more. And uh, the answer is that actually different problems really need different solutions. The things that are ideal for parallelism uh, are not necessarily very useful for concurrency. And while you can use concurrency constructs to achieve parallelism, it's, you know, it, it's kind of a bit overpowered. Uh, so often the, the tools for parallelizing can give us some nice simplifications. So let's start out with uh, a model that you can find in pretty much any language that gives you access to the, the primitives, uh, the model of threads, mutexes, condition variables, and semaphores. I kind of think of these a bit like the, the assembly language of concurrency and parallelism. Uh, they make the hard things possible. Uh, they make uh, it possible to build the easy things on top of them, uh, but they are not necessarily particularly pleasant to work with. But since everything builds on them, we'll just spend a few minutes talking about them anyway. Here's a CPU. That's uh, an i7 uh, of some kind. It's, uh, it's quad core. You can see the four copy-pasted bits there. Uh, are, uh, I guess that's roughly what it is, right? Um, yeah, of course, they flipped a couple of them for, uh, for faster interconnect and so on. But that, that's basically how it looks. Uh, what's all this chunk of stuff at the bottom the taking up loads of space? Cache. Yeah, cache memory, OK. Um, and actually, uh, each of those cores also have cache memory as well. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. So uh, how can we get code to run on a core? Well, the most primitive way uh, and the way that maps into how the operating system thinks about things is to start a thread. And in Perl 6, we can uh, do that pretty straightforwardly. Uh, here, we just do a loop, OK, 1 to 5. Uh, we say hi from thread ID. We sleep 1. We say bye from thread ID. And uh, then we join uh, all of the threads. That just means wait until the threads are completed. And uh, that will just spit out, uh, you know, hi, bye from all of them at roughly around the same time. Um, the exact ordering will vary. Just because you set them off in uh, one order doesn't mean they'll finish in the same order. That's how, how things work. 
Another thing that you have to be aware of is that basically nothing is atomic. Pretty much nothing, uh, unless you explicitly make it so. What, what will the output of this be? Something about 50,000? OK. Any other guesses? Less than 100,000. Less than 100,000, you think? Let's, let's try and, uh, and run it. Actually, I, oh wow, I didn't copy this. Wonderful. Uh, can, oh yes, OK. Uh, oh wow, I, I can't type at all. Uh, concurrent gets example. Watch one do I want. OK, O2, increment is not atomic. OK. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So the, the thing to always keep in mind if you're working at this level is um, there's no promise of execution ordering between threads unless you explicitly arrange for it. And nothing a thread does is atomic unless you explicitly arrange for it. OK? So anything in your program where you do not see something enforcing order, there won't be any. Um, and that, that is pretty much the opposite of what we are used to when we do imperative programming. So one of the lower level mechanisms for getting some control over this is a lock. And uh, this is kernel supported, which means that if you're waiting for it, the operating system knows not to put your thread on the CPU because it's a waste of time. Uh, and uh, this, uh, of course, will, will make our program get the correct answer. Uh, it also will mean that we don't do any parallel work. Okay, why? Because one thread grabs the lock, the others patiently wait in line, then they get it and then they do it. This code, however, is uh, not something you should ever write. Um, not so much out of don't work at this level. What, what could possibly go wrong with code of this, uh, this style? There's no deadlock risk in this particular case, no. Um, exceptions, yes. What happens if we throw an exception? We do not let go of the lock. Okay, That's, uh, that would be very, very bad. So instead, we have lock protect. Okay, you pass it a closure, it acquires the lock, it releases it in all the possible places that you could want it to, including control exceptions. Okay, so uh, that's that's pretty important. Of course, uh, we can switch it to be like this as well. And this gives me a nice, uh, this will get the correct answer, by the way. It's giving me a nice chance to talk a little bit about the caches on the CPU. Because uh, it turns out that if you actually run that, all of the CPU cores are scrambling to get at that data at the same time. So what happens in the CPU when you want to get at a bit of data and change it in memory? Well the CPU core has to get that bit of memory exclusively held in its cache. Exclusively means every other CPU core has to throw the data out of its cache. Then, if it wants to read it or update it again, it has to get it back. At a minimum, that is a 60, 70, se uh, not second, sorry, that would really suck, uh, 60 or 70 cycle penalty for doing that. Also, remember, a lock is a data structure. Okay, when you acquire a lock, you are just putting a normally your thread ID into who has the lock now, which means you're just writing to memory. So this actually is the cost of lock contention as well if you actually are competing over a lock. Uh, and that's the best case. Uh, if you actually have a multi-chip uh, system and uh, that's, that gets into some hundreds and so forth. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty costly. Even putting that aside, working at this level is kind of tricky. Uh, a thread is not cheap to start or end. So if you want to do fine-grained parallelism, this is a bit costly. Uh, if you want to get a result back to the thing that started the work, you have to invent that mechanism yourself. Uh, answering how many threads should I have is also a very hard question. It depends on the problem. It depends on the, uh, the machine you're running on. Uh, it depends on memory, all sorts of things. So it would be nice to have some better defaults around that. So when should you work at this level? Um, when you really, really have to. Okay? And I, I've very, very rarely done this. If you look at something, even something complex like uh, Crow that I talked about yesterday, uh, we don't use this directly anywhere. 
Okay, nowhere. We build it entirely in terms of the high-level constructs. Um, when have I used this? Normally when I'm writing native bindings. So when I wrote the async bindings for libssh and uh, OpenSSL, uh, still have nightmares about those, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I used Fred and Lock uh, at that level. So stepping it up a bit, uh, tasks on a thread pool. Okay, so what's a thread pool? A thread pool is one or more threads and a queuing mechanism. So that is a mechanism where I shove a piece of work in a queue and one of the threads in the pool takes the work and does it. That means that the runtime can decide how many threads are required. It means we don't have the overhead of starting and stopping a thread. Uh, so we can uh, more easily do fine grain bits of work. The threads get reused over time. So that's kind of nice. Here's a, a little boring example. Uh, we, uh, we just take the, uh, the scheduler, we queue that uh, block of code to run on it, and it will go off and, uh, and run first. I think I have this as a, uh, an example that I can, can show here. Yes, so scheduler, and uh, okay, that, that worked out pretty, pretty much fine. Um, one of the other things you can do is you can actually get a little bit of information about what the scheduler thinks. Uh, I hope I spelled this right. Um, oh, there we are. Okay, now this output is kind of interesting because uh, we can see at the top it created a worker thread in the pool as soon as we give it some work. And uh, it also starts a thread called a supervisor, which has the job of deciding how many threads to start, starting extra ones if we need to. And you'll see it's detected that I have four CPU cores available. And it has quite happily, as I gave it tasks, and it spotted that uh, the workers are busy, started more workers. Up to a point, you'll notice it, it creates the initial one, it adds, it adds, it adds, it's fine. Then afterwards, you'll see it, it has this heuristic low utilization deadlock situation detected, which is a big mouthful way of saying, hmm, it looks like if we had more threads, things would go better. Um, and basically what it's doing is trying to detect situations where while it would be ideal not to have more threads than we have CPU cores, sometimes we need them in this program. And of course, we, in our program here, we put the thread to sleep. So that is why it decides to, uh, to start some more. Of course, this still sucks because normally we don't just fire and forget code. Normally we care if it succeeds. We care about being able to hang on till it's completed. We care about getting errors. So this is where we need some kind of way of uh, sending back a result. And uh, a mechanism for this in Perl 6 is called the promise. So a promise in Perl 6 is in one of three states. It's either planned. That means the operation plans to produce a result at some point in the future. Uh, or it is kept, okay, because you keep promises uh, if things work out well. If uh, the operation failed, the promise is broken, okay? And of course, uh, in, in some languages, they say the promise was resolved or rejected. But, you know, when, when have you, uh, you ever sort of complained to someone like, oh, like you, you promised that you would do this, but then you rejected it? No, you don't say that. You say broken. So uh, that's why we call it this in Pulse 6. So the start uh, statement prefix does two things. It schedules a piece of work to run on the thread pool. Wow. And uh, then it uh, returns a promise representing that piece of work. So this is kind of handy in situations where, you know, for example, uh, I want to read two different configuration files and pass them at the same time. I just start the two, uh, and uh, that sets them off being worked on on the, uh, the pool. Then I await. Await in Perl 6 can actually take a list of promises to await, and uh, that's, that's often convenient for situations like this. And then it just returns them into a, a couple of scalars there just using normal list assignment. And uh, it also unpacks the result. And if either of those was to throw an exception, the exception would be rethrown in the code that's awaiting it. So uh, you get error conveyance and so forth. So this is relatively simple. It's very good for bits of task parallelism. Task parallelism is a situation where you say, I have two or three or more different tasks, and I want to set them off at the same time. It's also good if you want to set some work off in the background and get the result later. 
Uh, for example, in uh, the Heat Profiler application we have, it sets off as soon as you, you load a, a profile snapshot, it starts reading it and passing it in the background and gives the user back control so they can type their query and uh, it gets some work done while they're doing that. So we can step it up a little bit by starting to have dependent tasks. And this is very good for divide and conquer problems. So if you do an await inside of a task running on the thread pool, what you actually create is a dependency graph. Okay, you, you implicitly have a, a set of tasks where the top one completing depends on this other one and uh, they can, can break down. Now, that is very suited for divide and conquer problems. That is a problem that you solve by breaking it into smaller and smaller pieces until you can uh, solve it. Uh, and uh, a, a simple example of this would be merge sort. So the way a merge sort works is we, we sort of take all the, the data to sort. We uh, split it in half. We sort the halves. And then we merge them. And because they're ordered, that is an ON operation, OK? Because we just go through the list and uh, take each item, depending on the size of it relative to the, the next item in the other partition. Now, you'll notice that this is uh, breaking things down bit by bit. OK? There, you see, we call merge. This is merge sort. We recurse on both sides. So uh, this is something that we could parallelize, like this, OK? So we say await, and then we start a parallel merge sort of the left partition. We start a parallel merge sort of the right partition. And uh, we only do it, uh, at a, I pick that number arbitrarily for now, uh, but uh, that's, that's how we can uh, get to a point where we say there's too little data for it to be worthwhile anymore. Um, and, and so we stop. Now, one of the interesting uh, things about it, doing this in Perl 6 uh, Christmas, uh, or 6C, as we, we, we normally call it, uh, if you run this, it will actually spawn lots and lots of threads. Um, and uh, in Perl 6.d, if you do this, and uh, I'll show you how in a moment, it actually only spawns threads up to the number of CPU cores. Let's just, uh, just show that. So if I run it under this uh, schedule debug, and what, what was it? It was a merge sort. Oh, goodness. What did I? Oh, I called it divide conquer. OK, wonderful. So if we run this, oh, wow. OK, that is with 6.d.preview on. Notice it actually started up to the number of CPU cores worth of threads. That's pretty nice. Now, if I, um, oh, that's very, I, I guess I forgot to write colon w at some point. OK, let's, uh, let's comment that back out again. OK, it's what happens when you prepare in advance. It sucks. So you can see a lot more output here, OK? And what it's actually ended up doing is starting a whole load of threads. Uh, in fact, it, it started so many, it eventually got tired and said, I'm not doing any more. Um, and uh, if we time it, let's get rid of the, the debug output just to make sure that doesn't skew it. OK, that comes out at uh, about 3.3 seconds. If we turn that back on and uh, time this one, it's, uh, it's significantly less, okay? which is quite a nice improvement. Uh, what's happening? What's going on in, uh, in 6D? Um, actually, when you do an await on the thread pool in Perl 6.d, it takes a continuation. And it schedules it to be resumed when the thing it's waiting on has completed. Okay? And we wanted to do this originally. This was always the plan. Didn't quite get around to it in the beginning. Uh, but what this means is that you can now have thousands of outstanding awaits, and uh, they'll just be spread over a, a small handful of threads. And in fact, your code will migrate across real threads each time you await, uh, provided it actually needs to, uh, which means that we can, can resume it uh, pretty much wherever it's, uh, there's a thread available to work on it, okay? which is also pretty nice. Um, getting continuations that can be resumed on different threads was a, a little bit of effort, but it, it's working very reliably now. One of the important things, though, in Perl 6, a lot of languages have an async await construct, but uh, the trouble is that await is great because it fits really well. At least for a lot of people, it fits really well with how uh, you think about an asynchronous task. You know, you go off, it does something, and I want to await its result. 
but in a lot of languages that have a wait, it comes with async, where you have to mark the enclosing subroutine or method or whatever uh, as being an asynchronous method. So imagine that I'm working on something and I want to await an asynchronous operation somewhere, but that particular bit of code is not an async sub, so I change it to be. But now I have to find everywhere that calls it and change it to be an async sub and do an await as well. And I have to go and refactor all the way along my call stack. That is not very fun. So what we've done in Pulse 6 is actually implemented a wait uh, with something much more like the go coroutine mechanism. So you get the, the nice things of a wait. You don't have to go and do all the refactoring overhead that, uh, that async would uh, give you in various other languages. So that's, that's pretty nice. So this is a nice approach when you have a problem that breaks down into parts and the parts maybe depend on each other. Um, and uh, this, this works pretty well, not just for, uh, for dealing with parallel things, but also a lot of async operations return a promise as well. Okay, parallel mapping, filtering, and looping. Uh, so what we've seen so far is task parallel uh, things, where we, we set off two different tasks at once. Uh, but data parallel is where I have loads of items, and I want to do the same thing to all of them. Uh, so, for example, uh, here I just take a, uh, a, a huge number of pr uh, integers, I grab out the ones that are primes, and I count how many there are. Now, that top program there, uh, on whatever hardware I tested this on, ran in 17.2 seconds. If I stick the word, the, a method called to race before the grep, that says I want to switch this not into list processing, but into parallel list processing. And then it magically runs with that little addition in 5.3 seconds instead, which is kind of nice. Now, hyper and race are the two keywords you can use to do this. Okay? And uh, hyper means that you want the order of the results to stay relative to the order of inputs. So it's not sorting, it's just preserving the order. So if I have items A1, A2, and A3, and I map them all with a, a hyper map, then I will get the mapped A1, the mapped A2, the mapped A3, and so forth. If I race, there's no guarantee of that. I'll just get them in whatever order uh, they're available in, uh, which can get a little bit less latency. Uh, there's a bit less bookkeeping to do internally, of course, uh, but uh, if you need them in uh, the, the original order, then, then hyper is the, uh, uh, the way to go. You can configure this a few ways. Degree is how many parallel workers you want. Uh, you can maybe know something about your problem that lets you tweak that. Otherwise, we'll try and do it based on the hardware. We also have batch, which you generally today will want to tune. And this is how many I items we take from the input data at a time and give to a worker to do. Now, sometimes your work will be very small. So you'd like to take a huge batch of items so you don't pay a lot of overhead for that interthread communication. Other times, each operation will be quite expensive, but you'll have a small number of things in your list, so you'll want a very small batch size. Now, over time, of course, what we would love to do is implement lots of clever hill climbing algorithms and all of that, so we can try and get a good default batch size. Uh, for now, if you're using this, generally you will want to tune it a bit to your problem. So, for example, uh, here I used a bigger batch size, um, I, I maxed it out on uh, the number of, of virtual cores on this hardware and actually got it further from uh, 5.3 down to 4.1, uh, which is uh, uh, even nicer. So, especially when we started out at, uh, the bank at uh, 17 point something. Recent example from a, a, a day job project. Uh, we were passing a, a file and that file had various formulas in it that we had to compile. And uh, this is the code I had. And we wanted this to load just a little bit faster. And uh, the order of the formulas matters. We wanted to retain the order of them. Uh, we need to evaluate them in order. They depend on each other. And actually, the work to pass and compile each one was uh, reasonably significant. So we, uh, we stuck uh, batch as one in there. And uh, that, that gave us a little bit of a speed up. So uh, you know, for that number of characters, that's a nice win. So when you have to do a lot of work, uh, 
for a bunch of items, and it's the same thing for each item, and it's independent between the items, okay, this is a good approach. Monitors. So state and concurrency don't really play very well together. But uh, objects can maybe help if they're done well. Because the, it, ideally, okay, an object is a sort of little uh, transaction boundary. And we come to an object and we say, please do this thing, and it does whatever it needs to of its state, and then uh, that's, that's it. Now, to do a good OO design that will work well with this means we have to follow the tell, don't ask principle. And that means that good OO designs don't have many getters, don't have many query methods. Why? Well, because the object holds that state, so it shouldn't be spewing it out to everyone else. Uh, instead, it should have command methods where we get, tell the object to do something. If we do that, objects become very good concurrency control boundaries. Uh, and some languages like Erlang are pretty good at enforcing things like this. Now, we could do something like this, okay? That we, we put a lock object in our class, <coughs> and then around the method body, we put a lock.protect. Of course, uh, it's repetitive, it's tedious, it's boring. We'll forget to do it at some point when we add another method. So I wrote a module called OO monitors. Uh, it uses metaprogramming to sneak these in for you automatically. Okay, so use the module, you get a new monitor keyword, and uh, then you just say monitor, the lock is done for you, uh, the locking is done around each method for you, and uh, you're good. Okay, so uh, that makes that a bit easier. One thing to notice about this code is uh, just following this, this tell don't ask principle. Here, when I want to get the data out of it, I actually tell it, here is an array, append all of the, uh, uh, the values that are in there into this array, okay? And of course, then it will call push on that array, and you'll notice that this approach ends up with this method controlling the lifetime of the operation. That's really important in Perl 6 because we have a lot of lazy things. If you do dot keys, okay, on, a, uh, on an array or a hash, what you actually will find is that the, uh, the thing you get back is a sequence, which is a lazy object. So if we returned a sec out of this method, then the concurrency control would no longer be helpful because the iteration would happen after we have returned from the method. And that's yet another reason to follow this, uh, this tell, don't ask design principle. So when is this good? Uh, it's good when you have state. Uh, that needs to be used concurrently. You don't have another good built-in mechanism to deal with it, uh, and you can come up with a good OO design. Sometimes you get really lucky, and you'll find that you have what's called a lock-free data structure available that can basically let you do the manipulation of data without needing a lock at all. And that is actually a lock neither in your program nor in the, uh, the library itself. Now, that sounds wonderful, and you might say, how is this possible? Okay, it sounds, sounds like Nirvana. Um, well, it turns out that CPUs provide atomic operations, and Perl 6 provides access to them. So earlier I showed you this plus plus thing. It turns out, if you write atomic plus plus, okay, and yes, there's a really long ASCII version if you don't want to find that character. <laughs> Then, that's an atomic increment operation. Only works on native integers, okay? And you should type an atomic int. This is very hardware connected. Um, and uh, that, that basically will, will do exactly what you would want it to do. It will atomically increment that. This is kind of cool, but it's only useful for a very limited number of things. But there's a construct called atomic compare and swap, which is actually useful for building pretty much anything. In fact, it's a, such a powerful construct that you can make any data structure concurrency lock-free safe using it. Um, that doesn't mean it's easy, it just means it's possible. So this operation is provided by the hardware, but if you imagine it in Perl 6 code, okay, it takes a reference. So that is RW just means we're taking a reference to something. It takes what we expect to be there, it takes what we want to put there, and it puts it there provided what is there now is what we expect. Okay, and that's why the name is atomic compare and swap. 
okay? And we return the thing that we actually saw there. So what can we do with this, okay? Let's, uh, let's make a concurrent stack. It turns out a concurrent stack is basically the simplest possible lock-free data structure. So to build a lock-free stack, we will have a linked list of these node objects, okay? So we have the value on the stack that we're storing, and then we point to the next value. And here we have a head, that is the, the start of the, uh, the stack. And then we have push and pop operations. Here is push. Now the funniest thing you'll notice if you're not used to seeing these algorithms is that it has a loop in it, which seems very strange for a push operation. What's happening? Well, what we do is we read the current head, we make a new node that has the value in it and points to what was at head, and then we, it's a little bit like doing a commit in a database, okay? We try and commit a new head in place of the old one. If we succeed, we're done. That's the last thing in the loop. Otherwise, we try again. This has a very nice property. It means if we fail, somebody else succeeded, and so our program has a global progress bound, which is much nicer than locks where we might deadlock somewhere. That's pop, okay? It's very similar, uh, except we have to deal with an empty stack. And uh, you can see we, uh, we, we just follow the, uh, the next and try to install that in place of what was there before. In fact, this loop form is so common that Perl6 actually provides a convenience form that does the looping for you, okay? So uh, actually our code just becomes this, okay? This, this operation in the lambda here is the thing to retry, and uh, it will automatically retry as many times as it needs to actually commit that operation, which is pretty neat. Now these things are fiendishly fun to write. Uh, stack is easy, Q, is uh, kind of harder. Um, try is uh, not actually quite so bad. Uh, now, the next ones that I'll try and do will be uh, a skip list and a list and maybe even a hash, and those are a real, real headache, uh, but uh, also kind of fun. So if you are in a situation where you need a data structure you can concurrently update, and it's one of these ones, uh, then you can look on the uh, the module ecosystem, and maybe that'll be one that's there for you, okay? So six out of ten, uh, eight, pretty good. Uh, number seven, reactive streams, okay? So I talked a lot about these if you were in my Crow talk yesterday. Um, so a promise that I showed you earlier represents a single asynchronous value that will be produced. A supply represents a stream of asynchronous values, uh, that may be produced over time, uh, infinite or finite. So lots of examples of these, okay? Things arriving on a socket, output from an asynchronous process, GUI events, and so forth. The really important thing that we've done in Perl6 is put a single data structure in place for dealing with these. So as soon as you have to deal with, you know, GUI events and the network together, um, you, you actually can, can combine them using the, the supply and react constructs we have built in. So Perl6, I think, is probably the furthest language uh, along in providing uh, syntactic support for, for dealing with asynchronous streams. At least I haven't seen, I've seen other languages going in this direction, but no one who's gone quite so far yet. Um, and uh, yeah, this is something that I, I really quite enjoy uh, working with. Um, Actually, an interesting story. I'm going to show you a very simple little asynchronous web crawler. When I was first thinking about how to do this uh, for, as an example, I spent a load of time thinking about how can I track when I've finished crawling all of the pages. And then I realized I don't have to. The, uh, the React whenever construct does it for me. OK, so let me show you how this works. So we will use the Crow HTTP client. We take a URL to start crawling, and we're going to try and visit all of the pages on this, uh, this website. We make an instance of the client. Uh, the client is thread safe. It can do concurrent requests, so we only need one instance of it. Uh, we have a, a hash of pages that we have already seen, and then I call crawl URL. I pass in the initial URL. 
inside of that subroutine, we check if we already saw the URL and return if not. We just say we're getting it. And then I say whenever the client gets this URL and it produces a response. Then I check the type of response I got. If it's a HTML document, I call get links. And uh, otherwise, if we get an error, we just say what went wrong. Then in get links, we do a horrible thing. We regex out all of the links. OK, don't ever really do this. And then we just call crawl URL on each of them. So how does it know when it's done? Well, it knows when it's done because all of the outstanding whenevers will have finished. OK, so all of the management of deciding whether uh, we, we have finished crawling this whole site is just tied up in whether we have any outstanding asynchronous operations that we're waiting for anymore. Um, this also provides concurrency control. Uh, so code automatically can run across a, a bunch of different threads uh, as notifications arrive that we have downloaded something. Uh, but uh, that scene hash, of course, needs protecting. Uh, that will happen automatically uh, thanks to this construct. It tracks the outstanding works. And if we forget to handle any errors anywhere, which is, of course, the bane of asynchronous programming, forgetting the errors, it will propagate them for us, and uh, our React block will just throw them. Okay, So that's pretty neat. So often I've found uh, that I can take a problem uh, and make it look like an event problem. And in Perl 6, for your concurrency problems, that tends to be a really good thing to do. It's often a very smart thing to do for concurrent problems in general. Uh, it often makes things a lot clearer, especially time. Uh, but uh, if you can turn your problem into an event processing problem in Perl 6, there's some, some really nice constructs in there to help you with it. OK, finally, channels and workers. So one of the, uh, the big questions in Perl 6 that uh, comes up as people start learning its concurrency model is what is the difference between a supply and a channel? So a channel is basically underneath a blocking concurrent queue. It's a queue that I can put something into, and I can wait for something to come out of. Multiple threads can send values. Multiple threads can compete to receive values. So the big difference is that when you have a supply, you as the sender of a message pay for its processing. Okay? And that gives us a back pressure mechanism. So if you have someone trying to send really fast on a supply, they have to pay the processing cost of the message. Therefore, they can't send so fast. And that back pressure gets propagated back up to the data source. That's great if you want it. But if what you actually want is to just send some work off and someone else to take care of it, that is where you need some kind of queuing mechanism. And that is where a channel comes in. OK, and that's a receiver pays model. So one little pattern you can implement is a staged event driven architecture, which is a very fancy way of saying we write a bunch of components that do something, and we make channels between them to communicate. So for the final little example today, we'll just build something that uh, searches JSON files based on a, a little JSON path query. So we will do a directory tree walk to find JSON files. We'll put the file names that we find into a queue. A bunch of workers will compete to take those and pass the JSON objects. And then at the end, we'll apply a little JSON path query, and we'll show the results. So this is the top level of my program. I just use JSON fast for passing. I use JSON path for searching. I make a channel to pass. That is the channel between the first two steps. And I make another channel uh, to search, which is between the second two steps. I start something that will find the JSON files. I here uh, start something, uh, actually eight workers, OK, so that xx8, OK? Uh, and each worker passes stuff from this channel and puts the passed value into that channel. Then we will, when we actually uh, want to tear this down, when we finish passing all of them, we'll close that channel. 
The searcher we start, it takes things from the to search channel, this one here at the end, and searches them. And then at the end, we just await all of these various different workers to finish. And if any of them were to crash in some way, this await will propagate the errors that come from them. <laughs> What's nice about this model is that each worker that I write is then a little single threaded thing that just does stuff in a loop. So this one, okay, just does a recursive walk. You can see when it's a directory, recurse, walk deeper. And whenever it finds a JSON file, it just sends the name of that file on this to pass channel. And when it's finished walking the directory, it closes the channel. Here, we just loop over the channel as a list. That just takes from the channel as soon as data is available. And if a bunch of threads are doing this, they are all competing to take things and do the work. We then slurp the file. There we are. We slurp. We turn it into a data structure by passing the JSON using the from JSON thing. And I make a little search file object that contains the path and contains the JSON object. If it goes wrong, okay, I make the same object, but I stick the error in there instead. Finally, we compile our query, our JSON query using JSON path, okay. It's a little bit like XPath, but for JSON, if you haven't seen it before, very nice. Then we go over that uh, list, again, taking things from the channel. We try and do the search. Uh, and uh, if we get a result, then we, we show the result. Okay, And uh, lots of little bits in there. I'll put the code on GitHub so you can uh, explore it uh, later. Okay, and, uh, But this is a, a channel-based system okay, where we, we join different operations by channels and we scale out the various pieces as we need. One of the really nice properties of this system, by the way, is if you ever want to know where your slow or where your bottleneck is, you just look where the big Q is. And uh, that's the, the big Q is before your slowest stage. Pretty nice. Turns out that you can also consume a channel reactively. And uh, that is how you multiplex different channels if you need to do so. Uh, so uh, I'll just mention in passing that you can do that. Okay, that, that's also pretty powerful. So when to use this? Um, well, when your problem feels like something you can structure as a set of stages uh, and uh, join by channels, this works pretty well. But more generally, a channel is always a useful thing to have when you want to send something off and want its processing to happen elsewhere. And you don't want to pay the processing costs now like you would with a supply. OK, so that was eight concurrency models in some number of minutes that might have been slightly longer than 40, but I hope not too many. Um, so uh, there we are. OK, so thank you very much for listening. And uh... OK, and if there's any quick questions, I can take them or come and grab me after the, the session. Yeah. Did I understand you right? You can use the keyword await without marking the subroutine uh, in which this command is without needing to mark this one as assing? Yes. That's, that's uh, outstanding. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I mean, your, your thread pool is the, the base of the continuation. So it, uh, yeah. Woo, that's a bit. Yep. Okay, anything else? <coughs> yeah, please. Uh, is it also possible to send, for example, continuations to different machines over network, something like that? No, not yet. Okay. That, that hurts my head to think about, but I guess, <laughs> yeah, at some point it would be really fun to do. The, the, que the question was, can we send continuations between different machines and uh, do distributed things like that? and actually distribute awaits over, over a, a network. Yeah, that, that would be terribly good fun. Um, and and <laughs> I, uh, yeah, get, getting them to resume across different threads was a minor headache. That one sounds like bigger headache territory. But yeah, if, if I'm really bored someday. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Anything else? Please. Do you, do you think about six different concurrent uh, ways of programming?
programming things for for AIDS? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't know, you know, if if we try and extrapolate between the different version releases, will I even be, it, it seems like an exponential thing, will I be alive by Pearl 8? I, I don't know. <laughs> that was a more macabre answer than you were going for, wasn't it? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Any more? Okay. Then uh, good snap and eat.